we have with us today the, the director of Bergman Island, Mia Hansen Love. and also the director of The Worst Person in the World, Joachim Trier. Thank you. And we're lucky to also to have our excellent interpreter, Nicholas Elliott. Thank you both so much for being here. I am a bit starstruck. Um, your, your films are f immediately were very close to my heart um, when, I, when I saw them, and I have enjoyed revisiting them in preparation for this talk. Um, and so I'll just start with an icebreaker question. I know that um, you, Joachim, and, and Mia have met before, um, and I just learned that you met on the island of Fora, which is the setting <laughs> for Bergman Island. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, about how you know each other. Yeah, I, should I start? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's true. I, I've been a fan of Mia's for a long time, and actually we were supposed to meet before. There's a French filmmaker called Michael Ers, uh, director who's not so internationally known yet, but he's someone you should look up. He, and he's a good friend of yours. And yes, I, he is. And he's a good friend of mine. And, he, and since I was a fan of your films and he knew, he tried to set up some dinner in Paris once and it never happened. And it became this thing, I really wanted to meet you. And I was fortunate enough, um, this must be, what, four years ago? Something like that, yes. Yeah, and, and I was a guest at something called the Bergman Week. It's something for those of you who are interested in Ingmar Bergman's cinema, you should really try to, to make that journey if you can to for a one at the, the Bergman Island once a year. There's, a, you know, people from around the world meet to, to have do talks about Bergman. It's like a seminar almost. And I was a, a, a guest and I was quite nervous you know to go to that place with the master of scandinavian cinema had lived and filmed and the bonus was that at the same time you were preparing your film and we had a wonderful dinner yeah. yes and i i remember uh, uh quite uh, well and what i remember also is that uh, it felt like i had known you uh, forever i mean uh, there is a few directors who I feel so much connected to, um, uh, as to Joachim. Uh, I've often been asked in, ask in France if I, when you make films, you, you're getting asked if you belong to a group of directors, and I don't have that. I, I feel quite lonely. There are, I have a lot of friends who are directors, and I have a lot, there are a lot of directors who I admire. But you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are part of a family. I still have the feeling of doing my film really on my own and, and, and not being part of any group. And of course, I mean, we don't know really each other. We just met once. But I, um, since I had seen uh, Oslo 31 of August, I, I really felt uh, connected to his cinema and his language and, 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 and the spirit of his... Um, of his, of, of his films, and then there was uh, Michael, this friend we have in common, and who I felt also very connected to, and, and, and you should see his films, I think, if you haven't uh, seen them, and, and Michael is also a close friend uh, to your... Um, to my my co-writer, Eskil, co they went to La Femis, the French National Film School together. Exactly. Uh, so um, that was uh, also something... Um, I mean, I had heard a lot of uh, Joachim and Eskil, actually, uh, through uh, Michael, but actually, yes, so when I, when I met Joachim, I, 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 I felt uh, I knew him <laughs> before already, strangely. I'll, I'll tell you how, you don't know this, but uh, I went to Les Beaux-Arts, like a, an exhibition of young art students in Paris, and I'd seen you act in late August, early September, so I knew who you were, and since you had a Danish name, I remember it, and I saw you there many years ago. So yeah, yeah, no, I've been stalking you for a long time. <laughs> um, and we have worked together with some of the same actors. I worked with Isabelle Luper yes, uh, right was. before you made L'Avenir and stuff. So, and, and I just, and, and we, we will stop this love fest. We'll put it on pause, <laughs> but let us just have this moment, please. Because we, I think we genuinely share some things. And I, I must say that, um, you know, I feel at home in your films. 
that, and your aesthetic and your way of treating time and, and, and your humanity and stuff. So, so I take it as a great compliment if you feel some kind of kinship. Yeah, well, yes, uh, definitely. It's the same with me. Once again, um, when I, what happened to me when I saw uh, 30, uh, Oslo 31 of August, and I, but I saw, then I saw, uh, the, the title in French is Nouvelle Donne. I don't know the title of... Nouvelle Donne? Reprise, Reprise, my, my first that film. I saw yeah. later, but the first <coughs> film I saw of you was that one. Uh, but I, I had a very strong feeling that I, I, I'm not even sure I've had ever since, is that I identified myself, to the character uh, who Anders was playing in the film felt like could have been in one of my films. And I think it was maybe the only time, talking about contemporary cinema at least, that I've had this feeling and that's, that's such a weird and strong feeling, you know, like to see a character in somebody else's film and to think that character, I mean, both the actor, but also the, 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 the character himself, he, I could have written it. Uh, like, it's, it, it could be out of one of my films. I, I'm not even, really, I, I'm not sure I've had that feeling ever again from any other films as strong as that, uh, as, as, the, uh, as I had at that time. I had made a film, my first feature, All is Forgiven, um, there was this character uh, played by uh, uh, Paul Blain, um, who was a, a drug addict, and um, it's the film takes place over uh, twelve years. So it's a very, very different story. But the, I think the character of Paul Blain in my film, who was a writer and a drug addict, and who ends up uh, who, 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 who uh, dies uh, at the end of the film, I think he had a lot in common. Uh, with uh, Anders' character in your film, um, and yeah. But I also think about Eden. For those of you who've seen the wonderful film Eden, which I think is a is a pure masterpiece, and I, I really think that when I saw that, and and uh, it was a, a couple few years after I'd made Oslo, I believe, right? Uh, yes, maybe th th three, four, the, three some, four years, something after. like that. Yeah, and it it really affected me, and I felt at home, and I I I. You know, I, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, but I still DJ once in a while. I've been DJing since the 90s. It's like middle-aged crisis. Instead of playing golf, I continue. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I know that environment. I know those guys. I, I you know, I, I really identify with it. And I've, I've, yeah, I've lost friends that to similar circumstances. You know, you have all these experiences of grief in that film as well. And but also of joy, and there's an optimism. But when I saw it, I felt it was kind of an inverted Oslo August 31st in a way, because Oslo August 31st is about 24 hours. And I, I, I try to condense a life into that of a young man who's lost. I'm generalizing a bit, it's, you know, but, but, but you, you, you made a film of 20 years where you're able to stretch a story of a young man's coming of age into 20 years. And they have similarities as characters. Is that there is a lot in common, but it's true what you said that is when you say it's the, like the... Uh, the opposite. The opposite and the same, I mean, the, the same, it's about the same thing, but told in the opposite way. But I think that got me jealous because all my films, they, I need so much time to tell a story. I need, you know, I need, uh, I need years. I, need, I mean, I, I, need, I need to put my characters in a situation where you see really time passing, when you see, where you see them getting older, and it's, my films are always about passing but of that's time. That's beautiful. And I, but I remember really envying the fact that you managed to capture the notion, that, that notion too, but while you were depicting one single day, and that's something I think I, I, I would never know how to do. But then, to, to give you a compliment back, if you look the, the, the worst person in the world, <laughs> sorry, this is gonna go on. Bear with us. So uh, the worst person in the world has a s more similar structure to Aiden again, because it, it that where I'm, I'm not, I wasn't as good as you. I couldn't stretch it to twenty years, but you kind of follow her for four to five years, like sort of formative transition from. But yeah. I felt at home watching the worst person in the world as well. I mean, uh, <laughs> I felt perfectly at home actually. <laughs> We're happy. We can stop now, right? We're done. <laughs> we, I peaked. <laughs> I, I, am, I have to say, I, I, you know, going into this event, I wasn't sure if you 
both were acquainted with each other, how well you knew each other's work, and so this is, this is a huge thrill just to hear. So I, I almost don't want to ask any questions, I just want to let you talk. <laughs> um, uh, but I do have questions, so... Uh, Please I, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I wonder if you could start by talking, since you kind of brought it up already, um, both of these films have a very strong direct connection to Bergman's scenes of a marriage, um, the episodic structure of the worst person in the world, which charts a relationship through episodes, through moments in time that capture kind of an essence of where um, a relationship or a, a, the protagonist's state of mind is at at a given moment. And then of course in Bergman Island, um, there, is, uh, there, are allusion, there are direct allusions to scenes from a marriage at the beginning of the film um, and, and uh, as the film that made millions of people divorce. Uh, and and that, that's kind of a specter, I think, that hangs over the film. Um, and I wonder if you could just each talk a bit about Bergman's influence and um, sort of, there, there, are so many, there are so many threads that I want to tease out that connect these two films. And I think this might be a good place to start. Should I try to talk about Bergman? <laughs> it gives me anxiety trying, but uh, yeah. No, listen, I, you know, I, I discovered Bergman late uh, in my film nerd experience, uh, and I'm happy. Late being I was probably 23, 24 rather than 17, like when I discovered Antonioni, you know, like he, and, and I was more, a little bit more mature, and I'm happy because Bergman had a huge impact on me, uh, a sense of ruthless, um, Proximity. The, the, the art of Bergman is the art of the close-up, of pushing the camera up against a human being and understanding that you can observe a person as intimate as possibly with the camera and you'll never penetrate quite what that character is. Uh, and I think that there's a truth to Bergman in his ruthless searching for uh, the, the marginal experiences within us as existential individuals. Um, he takes uh, his characters to very shameful, uh, sometimes ugly, sometimes terrible places, but they feel truthful. Uh, and uh, there's a sense in his cinema of uh, going into situations of relations of siblings, relations of partners of love, um, all kinds of situations where that are often idealized in cinema and he kind of you know tears off the veneer and the surface and 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 pushes us into spaces that are quite uncomfortable but that feel truthful and therefore kind of comforting as if his, his films are a, a, a space for uh, allowing ourselves to feel things that we don't encounter in normal everyday conversations which i think is very strong in cinema i, I think that that possibility of of being in, in a space with someone intimately in a movie uh, where you can allow yourself to feel things that are almost forbidden. So the bar is raised high when the, when the filmmakers are asked to compare their work to Bergman. I, I, you know, but what I can take away from that is the, um, uh, in The Worst Person in the World specifically, one of the motivations for doing it, which I have to, honestly, I don't tell so many people ahead of seeing the film, so I hope some of you have seen it so I don't ruin it too much, but the end of that film is, is a very, very uh, honest conversation between two people who have been in love, they've separated, and he's going to die, and they know that there's nothing else left for them to do than to just be honest with each other. And I think Scenes from a Marriage, for example, has that feeling of, ruthless honesty that you recognize only in very special moments in life and that art don't always you know try to pond, uh, go into and i that that motivation for me is is inspired by bergman i think his spirit if nothing else i don't know if i can talk uh, about bergman in english and at least not as well as you do so i may switch to french at some point uh, to 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 be more at ease um I, th I think, uh, well, I, I, I totally, of course, uh, agree to all of what you said. I, I think, in a very simple way, um, what makes Bergman so important for me is the, 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 the way he looks at human relationships, relationships between a man and a woman. He did that all of his life, basically, and I think nothing 
uh, interests me more in life than that, than watching a man and a woman or two women or two men, I mean, um, loving each other or hating each other, having a conversation. And, and Bergman only did that. And, and that, to me, makes him the greatest. The fact that he, he spent his whole life as a director exploring uh, human relationships. And it did, and just as you said, it 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 did it with such a great, uh, uh, avec uh, courage, enfin bravoure, sans 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 peur, sans 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 honte. With courage, with bravery, without fear, without shame. And et à cause de ça, il sera toujours un modèle pour moi. Je 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 prétendrai jamais arriver à à regarder les relations humaines avec la même crudité, avec, dans, dans, dans une telle nudité, mais, mais ça reste euh, quelque chose qu'on qu veut atteindre. Enfin, c'est un modèle parce, du, du fait de la, oui, de la vérité qu'il a réussi à, à atteindre dans sa, dans sa représentation des, des relations humaines. Sorry. So because of that, this will be a model that I would never pretend to achieve in showing human relationships in their full rawness, in their nudity, but it's still something that we strive to attain. Um, it's a, a model to go after because of the truth that's achieved in its representation of human relationships. And in, in his films, it never seems for him that, that for him it's about what the public is expecting, how it should be, what is a good script. It's never about that. It's only about like his obsession of telling the truth of what he thinks a relationship is or uh, uh, what, what, how he looks at a woman or at a man. And, he, and, and he, it's, he's focusing on, on that look and on, on, in his quest of getting closer and deeper into the person. It's only about that. And what's so great about this film is that they're actually so entertaining. I mean, he never ask, it, it seems like he never asks himself how to please the public. How it, he never does any compromise. He's so radical. And at the same time, I, I, well, I, I don't know about your opinion if, if you watch his films, but to me, his films are never boring. They're actually very entertaining, especially since from a marriage, you can't, you, you can stop watching it once you, 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 you. And, and, uh, and, and that's so amazing that he managed to, to be so entertaining, to make films with such a great rhythm when he was only telling the truth, you know, to capture your attention with, with the truth and not with, with tricks and, you know, scripts things in order to, to you know, to, to please you and like so many films do. And, um, and I think that's all, that also makes him uh, like an eternal... Uh, Uh, c'est ce qui le rend tellement désirable pour moi aussi, c est, c est, c est, c est cette absence de, de compromis qui, qui caractérise toute son œuvre. That's also what makes him so desirable for me is that absence of compromise that characterizes his work. I, uh, I want to use this as a jumping off point. There's, uh, there's a moment in Bergman Island, uh, well, there are several moments really when, when uh, Vicky Creeps' character Chris who's a filmmaker uh, visiting Fora, the, the, the eponymous Bergman Island, uh, she is sort of troubled by Bergman, by the fact of his films, by his uh, seemingly being disinterested in making films about happiness mm. uh, and about uh, even the pursuit of happiness. There's, there's, she's, she's genuinely uh, perturbed by, by the, the sort of... Um, seriousness of his films and the and the attention to dysfunction and to yes. conflict and to angst uh, and Bergman Island is a film that I think is very interested in the pursuit of happiness if not happiness itself then in striving to achieve happiness um, and I wonder if you could just talk a bit about that about ha about um, how the film, the film contains this observation about Bergman and then goes on to do something entirely independent uh, of that observation. Yes, well, I think on, on the one hand, as, as you notice, uh, I, I am, we are <laughs> great admirers of Bergman, and on the other hand, but maybe also because I admire him so much, I don't want to imitate him. I, I don't want to be a small Bergman, you know. <laughs> I, 
uh, no thanks, you know, or just like, uh, it's like same with Romer, for instance. I'm a huge admirer of the films of Eric Romer, but I never wanted my films to look like, you know, little Romer films. Uh, I want to do my own thing, whatever it is. I, I think if, if, if it has a meaning, if, it, if it's worth existing, it has, it, it has to exist for itself and, and not as a you know, like a replicant of something that was uh, greater, you know. Uh, but just as Chris, I have to confess, I, I've had this feeling often about Bergman, like why do I love his films so much? I hate them at the same time. I, I hate them because they, they hurt me just as he says. They hurt me because of what he says about life. It's so hard. I mean, if you take him seriously, and I take him seriously, uh, it hurts, you know, what he says about the, the impossibility to, to be together, to love each other properly, to, uh, it's, it's discouraging, I find. Uh, but still, I, 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 I love them because they are so honest, so truthful, so... But as a director, I'm looking for something else. And um, as I was writing this film, it was a constant meditation for me about uh, while I was writing it and directing it about what we are looking for as directors and I was I was always amazed by th by the fact that uh, Bergman obviously must have had some must have feel some ex uh, great pleasure while he was going into his darkness you know and I wish I had that because if I had that I also could look at uh, human relationships uh, in their cruelty, in their brutality, but I cannot do that because I need the films that I do to bring me some light. I, I need them to bring some, some light and some happiness to my life. I, I, otherwise it would be self-destructive. It would affect me. If, I, if, if my films were going to be too pessimistic or dark, it would really affect me. But so I admire that a lot in his film. And on the other hand, I know I, c I could not do that and, and I have to find my own way and it's, it's going to be uh, some, some, something else. Um, and it's difficult because you want, at the one hand, I want to be true also. I, I, I don't want to make life sound easier or nicer or smoother than it is. But on the other hand, uh, while I'm trying to be true, I also need to find some kind of light, as I think you do too in your way, in your films. And I think the reflections of Chris about Bergman, they deal with that concern of, of, uh, of uh, finding a way uh, as an artist to go in the direction of light more than of direction of darkness, dark side of life. No, no, I agree. It's just I, I, something struck me. You know, you don't know this, but in a way, in the worst person in the world, and here we go again, folks. Uh, it's um, the ending shot of that film. It's, it's kind of stolen from L'Avenir. In, in, in that film, it, it means something completely different. But the last shot you did in that film is Isabelle Le Père holding her grandchild, and you track out and you track backwards out throughout the hallway of the apartment and you see where she has lived her life mm -hmm. and you kind of see what's left. It's, a, it's an argument, I've used that film as an argument against this push towards all of us having to do TV shows all the time. I use La Vendée and I say, yeah, TV shows are great, but a part of telling stories of character to me is to let the character belong to the audience. And to make, in a reason we say at the end of a sentence, a full stop, you say this in English as well, yeah, like a full stop, which then creates an ending and an absence and a and resonation that will live on. And in your film there, it's a tremendous ending. It's like an existential, like a, an axe goes down and says, stop. And then we, I had to take that home and think about it. And there will be no other episode because your character's journey is ending. And that gives me the possibility not to tune in in the next season, but to say this is a finite story. And it's a story of existential uh, pondering through it being finished because life finishes too. So the end of your story mirrors that character's end of existential journey in a way. So I stole that track out at the end of my film. I don't think you did that. No, yeah, but kind of like that. <laughs> 
and it's an optimistic ending, my friends. So she's making sense. I made, I've had made more pessimistic endings in my previous films. I have. But this last one, I really wanted there to be hope. I really, I'm older. I, I feel more hope. <laughs> I, 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 think, I, I do think the older you get, the more optimistic you become because you have to. You know, when you are young, you can afford to be very pessimistic exactly, and melancholic. Exactly. And when you get yeah. older, you need to. Otherwise, you know, uh, what, what will save you? Uh, but but I, I do think this thing you're saying about the endings of films is so crucial. And it's ex I, uh, to me, it is really crucial. It, it really tells everything about where you are as a director, how you want to end your films. And I, I like so much this idea of stopping a film. How, how did you say? Like, an, like with, with an, an act? act. So like you cut time it's, and it's you, say, you leave it in respect to the audience and say, take this home if you want to and hopefully think about it if we did anything that made sense. You know? So and exactly how I feel about how, film, how films should end. And I think it's when they end like this, that makes you feel that the life of the characters continue. Actually, the more brutal they end or the more... If, if there is no ending, that's when life continues behind the screen, whereas you have so many films when everything is, you know, double, I don't know, packed and, yeah. and you know, like completely tied, tied up, exactly. So, but it makes you feel that once the film's over, there is nothing left, you know? And I think it has to do with also giving this feeling of life being bigger than, than the film, and it's just the film stops, but not the life behind it. I've had that feeling recently uh, um, that, uh, about the film of uh, Bergman, <laughs> again, sorry, that I watch again. I'm a little bit obsessed about, by that film. Uh, it's a film called The Touch. Uh, have you seen it? I haven't seen The Touch. It's the it's American film with Glenn Gould, right? Yeah, it's really, yeah. it's one of my favorite Elliot Gould, films. sorry, Elliot Gould. And, and, um, and uh, sorry if you haven't seen it, so I, I won't uh, tell you the whole stories uh, not in order to not spoil it, but in that film, the way uh, Bergman ends it is it's uh, uh, regarding that idea of, uh, you know, stuff in, in that's, that comes to a degree that's really <laughs> extreme in that film. That what I mean is that there is just a scene. Well, the film is really strong and, and um, it's not like uh, the film really tells you a story, actually. But at some point, it, it really feels like he, he, wants, he wants to stop the film, he stops it. You know, it's like he's in the middle of a scene and then you have this one shot and then it's over. There is no more. And, that, that's, and, and, and the first time I saw the film, I was shocked. I was even angry, like, but come on, you can't leave me like that. <laughs> Give me an ending. But then the more I, I watched the film, the more I enjoyed it. And I, I, I actually, f I f at first I, I thought he was just, he didn't like his film. He actually didn't like his film. And I thought it's just because he doesn't like the film, he just abandoned the film, he just okay. drop it, you know, like, like a boy who would stop to play a game or something. But now the more I see it, the more I realize it makes sense because it's really about life, you know. Um, it, really, it, it, really, it really leaves you with such a strong feeling when the film stops and you are, you are even more with them than, I think, than, than if the film had really, you know, tried to give you a proper clean ending. This is a perfect segue into my, my next question, uh, which is uh, the idea of art making as therapy, as therapeutic. Um, I, this is a, a line that is, is spoken in The Worst Person in the World. Uh, the character of Axel, uh, who is a cartoonist or graphic novelist, uh, is being interviewed and he talks about his art making as a, a therapeutic process. Uh, and I think that's something, Mia, that you've spoken about in interviews before and just that comes across very strongly in Bergman Island, if only within the narrative itself. Uh, the character of Chris is making a film that uh, gradually it becomes clear is sort of a working out of, of her own feelings and state of mind. Uh, and so I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about that idea of how making a film can be therapeutic, both for the filmmakers the, the people involved in the making and in uh, the receiving of it. Yes, well, it is totally for me. I, I would I would like to lie and say it's not because I I don't know if it's something that is I don't know if it's good that it is uh, that to say I don't know if it's good to say films are therapeutic for me. It doesn't when I hear it it doesn't sound very cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I have to be honest, they really are. I think it's why I make films somehow. It's uh, to, 
Uh, I don't do psychoanalysis per personally. Maybe if I did, I wouldn't make films. I don't know. <laughs> and maybe I, I, I'm not saying the film should be made because to, to do that, but I think for me, films were always, uh, they always had to do with grief, with getting over something, filling a void. It's just the way it is for me. Since I ever started making films, all of my films, each of them, each in their own way, had to do uh, with, with I, I, not with grief, but with, um, yes, um, so, so, so reconcilier, uh, reconciliate. Becoming reconciled. Uh, uh, finding some kind of peace. Uh, they had to do with memory. They had to do with, yes, coming over, uh, getting over some stuff. Uh, that's the way it is for me. I, I, I feel the same, but I, it's become a gradual discovery for me. I, I wasn't so clear about it. I, I, maybe I'm, I was ashamed when I was younger and I was making my first film, Reprise. Uh, I was writing it with one of my best friends, Eskil Fucht. We still work and write together, who you, who you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, it was about two young men who wanted to be writers and they were best friends and they were very scared that if one of them stopped being a, a creative person, they would lose their friendship. And everyone was asking us, who's who out of the two guys? And no, oh, no, it's not us. And, and it wasn't. So that was true. But I realized after the film that those who cared about the film <clears throat> were the ones who we had involuntarily revealed ourselves to and that it was a satisfying process that I could both hide behind characters but also share a conversation with strangers that I was not aware I was having where I was beyond my intention revealing our shared anxiety of not being successful or not being able to be friends or losing uh, a sense of youthfulness and, and, and integrity and all those things that that film was about was exactly what we, was go what we were going on, what was going on in our life while we were creating it. And it's continued like that. And I feel in a context like this, it's easier to talk about. But I, I'm very shy about talking about my personal life in public. But in my movies, I try to be very, very honest and personal. <laughs> so I, I can identify when they say maybe it doesn't sound so cool that it's therapeutic. And I don't start out thinking it is. But I realize through the process that there are pieces inside my films that I haven't resolved. And sometimes a few years later, I look back. And if they have been successful creatively for me, I've, I've dealt with something. And they've put certain things at peace for me. So that, that I guess, is a therapeutic process. But it's not how I start out thinking they would be. I, I, it's a place to be. It's become my life. I make films and I'm, it's all I know how to do. And I'm very grateful every time I'm allowed. So I fill it with something I care about. And it turns out I, I, I care to try to yeah, deal with loss, grief, memory, these mm. things. And something that strikes me now that as we are talking about your films, I think most of them also deal with vocation, actually. In most of your films, just as, in my films, I think it's all of them, so, uh, one way or another, I, but I think uh, maybe at least four of your films deal with characters who have a vocation, who are artists or writers, or whether it be, uh, you know, another vocation, but still are habited by this, kind like of obsession, quest. obsession, war photographer. Yeah, Isabella war is, photographer, yeah. but it's also a vocation. <laughs> and um, I wonder how you feel about that because uh, I'm curious to know because for me it's almost like a handicap that I feel that I, until now I could never make a film where the main character didn't have a vocation, you know, just as I have. And I wish I could, and I, 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 not, I don't think anybody needs to have a vocation or an, art, an artistic vocation or a vocation. It's not like everybody has one, but I, I, I felt handicapped. I've always felt handicapped by the fact that I, I wasn't able to ever portray a person who didn't have a vocation because vocation has been so much in the heart of my life and in the way I work, in my personal, you know, balance that I, I don't even know how to portray <laughs> everyday life without this concern. And I, I was, uh, and, 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 but that's also very much there in your films, the, I think, the question of vocation. And I was wondering if you were 
aware of that or how you deal with that? I, I feel that write? the more you talk about it, the more I feel ashamed of my lack of imagination that all my characters are, I want to be creative. But it's true. I, I, it's like, it's, it's, I didn't mean it no, as no, a No, 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 my friend, know? listen, it's all good. Like, it's fine and you're right. And, but, but also I deal with in many, in many of the characters that Eskel and I have created, it's they, they don't seem to accomplish they are the, the, the idea of ambition or fulfillment of some potential. Like the worst person in the world is about someone who keeps changing an angle or trajectory at different kinds of work and don't feel that she belongs anywhere. She doesn't have a, a, a room of her own to be no, with. But I, I thought of Anders in the film, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she admires that because Anders' character plays... A, a, a graphic novel. also very central as a character. Completely. I mean, although, although yeah, yeah. The film no, is no, you're about right. Her, so, he's, so he's you're hundred percent right. That 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 it's that play as a subject, a, a theme, absolutely. And and I I think my struggle in life has become trying to do something else than make movies and be a human yeah. being outside of it. So that's been my journey, and I'm accomplishing it more and more as I get older. But no, completely. I it's, I, I I I like to make movies, and I'm very. My life is quite simple that way. <laughs> So th though that ref is reflecting the characters I create, I guess. Once again, I feel like you've anticipated my question because I, uh, I wanted to bring up how both films are really about work and the conflicting con commitments between a person's work life and their love life and their family life and their sense of self. And um, in, in The Worst Person in the World, it's, it's a case study of a woman who's figuring out what her vocation is. It's figuring out what she wants out of life, out of all of these avenues in her life. Uh, and in Bergman Island, uh, it, the, the protagonist is a little more settled, but not entirely settled. And she's still navigating the intersections of her vocation with her family life, with her marriage. Um, and uh, I just was hoping that you could both talk about that and how both of these, both of your films really center romance or, or romantic connection as, as sort of a, a focal point for navigating all of these intersecting questions. Um, but the, the question of work and of what we want to do for work, what an, a person wants to do for work and who a person wants to be with and how a person wants to conduct their life, these are central to both of your films. I think Julie in, in, in my film is a person who is yearning for some sense of meaning and purpose and she doesn't know how to find it and I think that it's a kind of a double bind that she thinks that a vocation will give her value uh, an idealized relationship with someone that idealizes her back a transactionalism is what will bring her happiness and I think it's a long slow journey towards mm -hmm. self-love or something I guess you know like writing it I discovered that she has to sit by herself and do something that she's comfortable with by her own at the end. That was like the, the end of the film. It's, it's a simple notion, but it's a complicated one in many people's lives to, to reach that. It's, and I, I was jokingly saying to a friend the other day, that I, this is my eat, pray, love. You know, this is, this is actually my take on, do you know this film with Julia Roberts? It's, 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 it's quite magnificent in existential terms. It's, it's about someone who... <laughs> who realizes she's always had a partner and she's never been alone. And she doesn't know how to love herself and she goes to Italy to eat, she meets an elephant, she meditates. <laughs> and through that she finds some sort of peace with herself. And I, I think that journey is something, some, something all people have to go through. I'm sorry for sounding like a sort of melodramatic hippie here, but uh, I guess I'm turning into one. But this is my take on that journey story of, of someone who will try to find that during their early 30s, you know. So I don't know if that was an answer to your question, but, but no, perfect. it's irrelevant, like, what is my purpose? Who, who do I dare be close to? How do I accept myself? Very basic things. I think that's uh, what I enjoyed so much about your film, uh, the way you portray that woman who doesn't know who she is and, and what she's gonna do and what she wants and who doesn't wanna have a baby. I mean, I, I not only because I thought it was uh, so not conventional, but I thought it was so daring to actually show uh, this kind of woman. Uh, we all know her. I mean, she's familiar. She's she's modern. She's part of our world. But I I don't feel like this kind of woman has been portrayed in film so much. And I think you do it in a very daring uh, way. 
uh, it's I, I I haven't seen that many films when where you see w when you make films you hear so much that characters need to have a goal you know they need yeah. to go from A to B and I always rejected that uh, as a, a viewer but also as a script writer and I always had problems with that with my scripts because when I write my script and I give them to commissions I always get uh, critics because of people saying that they don't understand why do my characters want and I always have to pretend they want something so I always try to find out <laughs> what they want <laughs> even if I don't know you know <laughs> so when I, I know when I go to this you know commission stuff where you have to talk I try to find out beforehand like what I'm gonna say about what they really want when I uh, and and so I was so thankful when I was you when I was watching your film to see the film that was not pretending that she wants something. It was in, it, like the opposite. You were really uh, not afraid of showing how how un unsure she is of who she uh, uh, how unsure she is of who she is, what she wants, and and uh, the fact that she rejects this and that, but actually doesn't know what she wants. You know, and and I and I think uh, even though it can it could seem a banal or you know like close to us, I I think in terms of cinema and what we are allowed to show and to ki what kind of stories we are allowed to tell today, I think that is actually very uh, daring. No, listen, I have to, I have to f answer because thank you for that. I, I actually, I also get that all the time since my first script that it's, my characters are too passive and they're not. And to be honest, uh, when, when I grew up, I was reading a lot of Magritte Duras, the French writer, and she talks about an alternative uh, sense of time and dramaturgy in literature and in cinema, which comes from a feminist point of view that I'm very inspired by, which is, she talks about female time, you know this term she's talking about, and she says, in, in our culture, if we look at someone in a garden just being there, if it's, if it's a male character, a man, uh, we expect this man to be preparing for war or or, or he's at unease, waiting for an event. He's, wh what is his action? What is his goal? Whereas traditionally, putting a woman in a garden, she's at home, she's just relaxing. But Duras turns this around and says, the power of that presence of time in the house, in the home, those untold female stories are the great stories of drama and they can be the st stories of family and presence and time and all these huge themes but they don't come through clear goals or clear conflicts. And I remember like Eskil and I was always comforting ourselves, like, well, there is that alternative strand of storytelling that exists parallel with the big uh, odyssey of the journey of the world and the conquering of the nations and all that stuff. So I associate more with that in a way. And I, when I see your movies, I, 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 feel, I feel that they're full of events and thoughts and character, but I, I know that it's not like, Okay, plot point one, turning point two. You know, like it's it's more like life. It flows differently, and I, I sympathize with that. I like that a lot. I uh, I'm conscious of time, and I want to make sure that we include uh, a special element of this conversation that I'm very excited about myself, which is that we have a, a special surprise guest to join the the conversation. Uh, who is uh, the actor Andals Danielson Lee, who is in both Bergman Island and the worst person. <laughs> While we're talking about um, women's subjectivity and women's experience of time and of, of the events of life, um, we have a very interesting perspective on that uh, with us, uh, Anders, as, as a person who played in both Bergman Island and The Worst Person in the World, a character uh, who's, characters who are sort of projections of the female protagonists in a way, uh, who, who are, he's uh, in, in The Worst Person in the World, the character of Axel is a very complicated love object to the main character, Julie, uh, and in Bergman Island, uh, the character of Joseph is an invention of Chris, the filmmaker, uh, in, in a love story that develops in the second half of the film that, 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 that Chris is developing as a screenplay. 
and, and Joseph is an invention of hers, a character uh, who is the love object of, of a character within that fiction, played by Mio Wojciechowska. And so I just wonder if you could uh, speak a little bit about uh, the experience of playing these incredibly complicated and well-developed male characters who are um, not on the periphery, but in the orbit of these very powerful women characters? Yeah, thank you. That's an interesting question. I never really thought of Axel as um, a love object <laughs> or a love interest. I wanted him to be always be seen from, from her point of view uh, by investing much more in the uh, relationship and the chemistry with uh, Renata. Um, much much more than I usually do or have done in your previous films where character psychology is, is the, the most essential uh, thing and the um, the way to approach the character. Whereas here it was definitely, uh, I felt that he represented a, a, a recurrent theme in, in many of Joachim's films, the uh, idea of uh, the passing of time and the melancholy that surrounds the, the passing of time. And there was also a little um, streak of an old fashioned masculinity <laughs> in him. Um, but it was interesting to let, let the character emerge from, from the relationship and uh, uh, let him be seen from, from her point of view. In your film, um, I had the impression that uh, I, I thought of him almost like a mythological uh, figure uh, in a, a Greek myth or something. Um, and I, I was thinking about Tadzio, you know, in <laughs> uh, Death in Venice and, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to compare myself to <laughs> Björn Andresen, which is the, uh, <laughs> the most handsome uh, guy in the world. Um, and I'm not, but that, that, that was uh, w what I was aiming for. And I wanted there to be uh, uh, some, uh, something obscure, some, some mystique uh, around him and something that, yeah, some kind of object of desire that you can't really um, reach out to. I, I want to open that up into into a question about your respective collaborations, um, um, Joachim and Mia, with with Anders, and also with with your ensemble casts. These are very sort of intimate relationships that you you seem to create and to nurture with your with your casts and with your characters. Um, and I just wonder if if all three of you could speak to that process to building the characters in collaboration and, and building their psychologies and um, just sort of how, how that happens. How we work, yeah. in a way, yeah, yes, the process. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, with Anders, we have like some shortcuts now, I think. But so we try to push that further and, and, and do new things. I think in the, in, um, in the worst person in the world, we were exploring something new in our collaboration in a way because yes, I treat you like you're a lead character, but you also knew that you were kind of not the point of view throughout the film, like in our previous work, you know? But I think our process was still similar in trying to figure out the relationship between just thematics. Like Anders is a very, the, the beautiful thing about you when, as an actor is that I think you have, uh, you're triggered by intellectual thematics at an early stage. You want to understand, you want to understand what we're talking about, what are we telling with the film? your analysis of the scripts are always enlightening to me because you see a lot of things I never thought about. That, like you, your perspective brings the script up one notch and I always got like rewrite it a bit to kind of focus it. Oh, that's what it could mean, you know? <laughs> so that's, so you trigger it. But when we actually work on set, you're extremely intuitive and in the presence and very emotional and not necessarily so intellectually triggered when, you, when you're when you acting. So that, that dichotomy in you is, is quite remarkable. But as you were saying very, very accurately, I think in in the, the last film we did together, the relationships was what it was all about. So getting you and Renata to trust each other, to explore that properly, we have a rehearsal period and we 
we never try to nail the scenes. We try to to build um, what I say, sort of an, a sense of authority around characters for you guys. You can take them over, and I can guide you on set. But it sort of becomes your film in a way before we go on set. There, uh, there are just different faces, you know, of of the. Uh, you, you, at some point, you you should go through an analytical phase, uh, but when you're standing there on 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 the set shooting the scene, um, it gets more intuitive. You can't really start analyzing too much at that point, and um, and there's also some sometimes there's a logic in the scene that you can only invent on that day. You can only discover the, the, the internal logic of the scene on that day. So it's like the scene knows wh where you're headed. And, and that's, uh, um, that's what you do when you make a scene. You, you are searching for something that is, um, uh, that is unknown, some kind of, of, of magic, I guess. Um, but I remember also thinking that that it was uh, um, well my my view of, of Joseph was that he could be more a kind of a uh, a model, uh, not in a in a fashion sense of the word, but in the Bressonian sense of the word, uh, the kind of of actor figure that uh, the 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 audience can project thoughts. Uh, um, ideas or, or, or maybe desires, that he could be open as a character. Or maybe you had something in mind that... Well, it's, it's interesting that you said that you saw him almost like a mythological character, um, because I could use that word, not, in t not, not thinking of the Greek mythology or something like that, of course, but in a way, more of my own mythology. What I mean is that, um, to me, that character of Joseph really refers to, um, he, he really incarnates uh, something that's in the very heart of my cinema. You know, the, the, the first love you can never get, ov uh, uh, get over. Uh, you know, the, you, uh, in, I, I made a film called Goodbye First Love. It was my third film and it was about this young girl who can never turn the page of her first love. And um, and so that's 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 a fragility, a weakness that she has, and that defines her. But she manages to turn that into some kind of strength. And I think this is the presque la, la matrice de mon cinéma. Uh, Nearly the matrix of my cinema, the starting that, point. That that idea of turning your fragility into some kind of, of strength, of making something out of your melancholy, basically. I think it's really like the key thing of my cinema. I think it's all about that for me. And, and um, what I found really uh, fascinating for me about your presence is in the film is that, as, a, as, a, as, as you know, as I said before, I, uh, the reason why I met uh, Anders is because I, I saw him the first time in Joachim's film, and when I saw him in Joachim's film, you, but also the character, the match between your presence and the character you, Joachim created, really felt like like um, I was... Uh, uh, like I was meeting someone I'd met before, again. And it's a strange feeling, you know, to have that feeling uh, while you see uh, some, uh, not your own film, another film, you know, and you, you meet a character and an actor who you feel belongs to your own world, your own mythology somehow. And for me, really, you, you incarnate that to a level, to a degree that is hard to express. I, it has to do with the kind of, I'm sorry to say so, but the kind of melancholy that emanates from you. <laughs> 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 um, but also with the kind of truth that you have, that you carry with you and I'm so sensitive to that you always had that uh, since in all the films that you uh, that I've seen with you but the first time I saw you was in was in Joachim's uh, uh, film uh, Oslo 31 of August and I was really uh, 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 struck by the the, um, the quality of uh, truth that you carry with you as an actor and that was striking me again yesterday when I as I was watching your film and 
uh, in all, your, of all of your scenes, but of course uh, it it's even more impressive in the scenes from the second half when you deal with such uh, uh, difficult things and, 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 and the, the, the truth, the sincerity and the, I would say the Brissonian truth that emanates from your way of acting. Uh, there is nothing I'm more sensitive to than this kind of presence. And what I find really um, strong and unique about Anders' presence in the film is, is, is the fact that you are both a um, professional actor, you have experience, you know how to act, you, you have a technique in a way, in your own way, I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, as a director, I, I, when I film you, I, I, I don't think I'm filming a non-professional, I film somebody who's been in many films, who knows how to act, and you have a lot of charisma, but at the same time, you have this kind of quality that most of the time only non-professional have, I find, you know, this kind of innocence and this kind of uh, simplicity of where being very direct in the relationship to the camera, no tricks, no... Uh, and uh, that's uh, really uh, powerful and um, I, I wanted to say that because it leads back to this question of mythology. For me it's, uh, if yes the character of Joseph was a little bit of a mythological character because of, be because of uh, the meaning of this character in the film but also because of you and what you represent uh, for me in, in, uh, as an actor in films. No, really, I mean it. I, I don't want to embarrass <laughs> you. <laughs> it's true. I, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about um, Anders' work in Bergman Island in particular and, and playing, a v it, as it turns out, not to spoil the film for anybody, but you're, you're ultimately playing an actor. You're, you're, mm. you're a character within the film, but then it is revealed at the end of Bergman Island that the film that you are a character in is in production and, and you are the embodiment of not only the character but the person playing the character. How did that play into your process and into your approach? Well, that was a moment of uh, almost total confusion, you know, <laughs> as to what is fiction and what is reality. But that's part of the reason why I continue doing this because I'm, I, it, it, um, really, really interest me. Um, the films that, that we have made together have sometimes been a crazy mix of things that we have experienced and people that we know and ourselves. And, and uh, the first that film that we made together uh, changed my life because I had one year left in med school. I had no plans of, of doing uh, a film at all, and uh, it took me on this crazy detour, 15-year <laughs> uh, detour uh, of acting, and uh, so so these films have impacted our own lives, and um, that uh, identity crisis that you can uh, put yourself in as an actor is is very uh, interesting. Because it's it deep down, this is how we understand our own lives. It's through stories and through fiction. Um, when we live our lives in the present, we it hasn't become a story yet. We don't really know. Uh, I don't really know what this trip is gonna, what the story of this trip to the U.S. is gonna be like. I will know uh, next month, maybe. So we kind of understand our, our, our uh, lives uh, afterwards when we tell stories about them. And that, the difference between that and fiction is not so big. Um, so I think working as an actor, working with uh, these uh, talented people is, feels like some, some way of, of therapeutic reflection on, on my own life. Uh, and I've, I've had a, a pretty ambivalent um, relationship to my career. I've tried to find a way uh, to, to be professional, but also to be able to approach roles as a human being. I think that's what Renato, uh, uh, Renato plays uh, the lead in, in uh, The Worst Person in the World. She does that. She, she has approached her role as a human being. 
And she's a trained actor, but she knew that if this is going to be really great, I have to to uh, uh, approach it as a human being, and and that's riskier. And in order to do that, you have to to trust your directors and know that that they know where to put the camera, that they know what they want with for intimate scenes, for example. Um, and that's why we are so uh, grateful to be working with uh, um, uh, people like M Mia and Joachim. Because um, uh, to me, they feel like responsible parents. I'm a child, I can play around and I can fall and, and make a fool of myself and uh, and search for something, always uh, be searching, and that's risky. And I, I, I have to know that I'm, that there's someone watching me, um, in a double sense of that word, that they are um, taking care of me, but also looking at me. Um, and uh, when I know that, I can approach my job as a human being and not as an actor. I want to, I, I, I could talk to you all for hours, but I want to open it up to the audience. It's got, it's, it, the Hannah and Sister's got chapters, it's got voiceover, it plays around with a literary form. And so, kind I'm of, if you had drawn I, I love that film, it's a good piece of cinema, yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a, it's a truthful story of humans. But no, I, I, I honestly, when you now mention it, it's a film I know very well, and, and it's been an unconscious thing. But I, 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 I remember watching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's a good, and it has uh, bringing us back to Bergman. It has Max von Sydow in it, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. In Helen and her sisters, he plays a kind of a European artist <laughs> with a much younger partner, and when she leaves him, his first quote is, "Oh, I still have so much to teach you." <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of we're riffing off that a bit too, aren't we? In in the worst person in the world. So yeah, you're right, sir. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm guilty. I I I like that film a lot. <laughs> Have I ever met someone <laughs> and liked them and then wanted to spend more time with them? No, no, I get your question. Yeah. Uh, how do I answer that? In my film, that would be rather revealing, wouldn't it? If I said yes. <laughs> Uh, it's true. Both of our films have that. It's, it's an accurate point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess during my lifetime I must have wanted to spend time with some people. Maybe even people one shouldn't have spent time with at that moment. <laughs> I think it is, it's interesting because I was actually trying. We talk in the context of Bergman and sort of European auteur cinema here. But I was actually in my own way starting out uh, wanting to do a rom-com. You know, and then you in American terms you have this thing called a meet greet. No, meet cute. Yes. Sorry, meet greet is something else. Meet cute. <laughs> and I guess that's what we're trying to do. We're we're doing that thing. You know, there there sometimes in cinema it's fun to do your version of something. You know, like how do you introduce the support character? Hitchcock would in Notorious do a long slow tracking shot into the back of. Uh, Cary Grant's head and he and, and he would see oh it's an important character and he would slowly turn around it's like okay that's how he played the introduction of the second character you know there are these things and I, I think this idea of how do you make people how do you get the audience to experience romantic feelings between people it's really hard and we worked a lot on that scene so for those of you who haven't seen the film Julie goes to a party meets a guy, she's in a relationship, they say, oh, it's obvious we like each other, we can't be unfaithful. And then they start questioning, what can we do though? <laughs> That's not being unfaithful. And they play this sort of game all the way through the night. So it's, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but no, I, I'm glad you, you see some patterns here. I'm always proud if I'm compared to her movies. <laughs> Uh, the story of the encounter in my film Bergman Island is um, um, is different. It's not something I wanted to do. Uh, it just happened actually, and it re really reflects the process of writing this film because 
um, in, so in my film, uh, the main uh, character, Chris, uh, um, as she, 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 she comes with her husband, although they are not married, but let's call him an husband, to the Bergman um, uh, Center, and he's doing a master class, and so she leaves the place, and that's when she meets, she sees somebody, as she, she's uh, buying something like glasses that she needs and that's that she and she sees somebody and they she kind of follow him and and they meet in the church where well anyway i'm, I'm saying that for the one who haven't seen the film uh, but um it's not something i wanted to happen when i wrote the script but it's more like the reverse it's because i went to for uh, with the idea of writing this script about a couple of directors and when i as i was there i met hampus and uh, we became friends, actually, and he really drove me around. And for some reason, I thought that moment I, I had with him where he was driving me around and really giving me the keys to the island somehow was like the missing part of my film. It was the one that connected me to the present. To He brought lightness, actually, into my story, and I loved that. And I thought it made sense to kind of um, uh, incorporate that into my film. So to me, the, this character of Hampus was really the one character who was bringing the keys to, to the island and to, to the fiction, but also to, to the lightness into the film. When I met him, uh, he, he was a film student, now he's working, but he's not an actor uh, at all. He, I, I met him because he was moderating um, 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 uh, Q&A after one of my films, so you careful, you may end up... <laughs> <laughs> you might get cast. It's a continual process. It's a great question, and it's it's a long one to answer. I'll try to be... I'll try, well, let's try to think of some specifics. I mean, honestly, it's... it's um, the craft of filmmaking as opposed to playing your guitar is something you can't do at home for free. So you need these experiences, like all, you know, you get better every time you make a movie. Uh, Bergman, which is kind of a theme here, I think made about sort of 10 films before he got really good, and I've only made five, so I hope I still have something, you know, in me. But <laughs> so it's a different pressure these days and a different system for making movies. But I, I think um, this thing of revelation that I talked about, like accepting my vulnerability and accepting to be more sensitive on set rather than to try to pretend to be the cool director and all those things. I mean, I think I've gotten better at relaxing and focusing on the right things. And I I'm get more and more, uh, I, I learn to trust my instinct and not only my plan, like in the moment. I think the job of the director sometimes is like um, realizing when everything is wrong and no one else dares to say so and have the bravery to say stop stop everyone got to rethink and everyone's like oh it's going to be overtime it's going to be expensive and oh the sun's going down and like figuring out those situations the more you train that stuff the better you get it but we're underestimating training right. honestly like people that, that i was a dancer for a while as a kid i was break dancing and i wanted to study ballet and i just had like five minutes in a ballet place and I thought, ah, i'm gonna go skateboarding but also because i saw how hard they worked you know it's a, and i was sloppy at that time i wanted to just have fun and you know i've learned to to have the stamina but i think it's like really working and doing it again and again and again yeah i do believe so uh, I, 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 the same way, actually, I do believe uh, uh, when you make films, you should make films. I mean, you should really try to make films, actually, because the more you practice, it, it can sound very uh, uh, materialist or, you know, uh, um, uh, but I, I, I do think what all I learned, I learned from making the films, really, from practicing. And uh, that's why I really get scared when I, when I after a few couple of months after stopping shooting, that I will, I, I never feel like what I've learned is I learned forever, although it's, it's absurd because, uh, of course, w every time you get back in a shooting and from the first day you know how to do it, I mean, it's like uh, riding on a bike. You, you, it's not something you lose, but still, I, I, I really think that the more the more you film, the more you the more you ask yourself questions, the more you learn, the more you experiment, the difficulties of a shooting, the the the, the better you 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 become. I, I, I really believe uh, believe that. 
I think that's a beautiful note to end on, as good as any. Uh, so thank you all so much.